So I read recently about 1,300 people died from this uh, pilgrimage. It's called the Hajj pilgrimage. From Saudi Arabia, what they do is uh, um, this year the heat wave of these people. So I'm just going to go on what they do. Uh, Muslims, they believe that they have to make an annual pilgrimage to the holy city of Mecca. And they do this because it's something that Allah has uh, um, prescribed every Muslim to do so. And once in a life, you have to make a trip to Mecca. And it's interesting there, they said over a million people made the trip this year. But during that trip, there's 1,300 people that died. They say the temperature in this desert, it exceeded 122 degrees. How many of you know that is pretty warm? And it's about 100 degrees right now outside. So imagine even more, 20 degrees more. That's deadly. So all these people were dying and because of lack of shelter, the dehydrated, the list goes on and on. But the point is, a religion makes people do some crazy things. How do you know that? Religion pushes people to do some wicked, wicked things. And this is part of it. But the reality here, a relationship has different results. So one, a religion forces people to face certain consequences if they don't do something. A relationship, it makes a heart love and have gratitude. Two, two, two uh, different things. Second Corinthians 9 verse 7, it says, Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a chill forgiver, and God is able to bless you abundantly so that all things and all times, having all that you need, and you will abound in every good work. This is God saying, with the relationship, things are different. You're giving out of a relationship Versus giving out of, oh, I have to do that. I, I have to make this pro pilgrim to Mecca. I'll tell you, that, that's being forced. There, that, there's no relationship involved. They believe if they do that, then they're going to check off a box. And hopefully Allah will forgive them. Well, we don't serve a God like that. We serve a God that uh, He loves us and He died for us. And we honor Him by, our, by just serving Him, by giving. I'm telling you, God does bless the giver. That's what He says here. He's able to bless you abundantly. How many know we need that? So let's go ahead and ask God to help us as we give. And I thank you for everything that does come in. God does move upon us. So I pray. God, I thank you for the blood. I thank you, God, for your grace, your mercy. Lord God, bless every gift and giver here, God, that we will give out of a cheerful heart. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Sing a song. What a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. The angels bow before. platform positions. Amen. Let's believe God today together. He's going to help us. So if you have your Bibles, you turn with me to Numbers chapter 22. We're going to start in verse 1. Numbers 22 verse 1. Amen. We serve a real good God that loves us and really does help us. Amen. Hallelujah. So this last Sunday, uh, last week, we played that video about the fathers, and they made a statement in there about the blessing. And I was thinking about that that uh, subject, and and I and I read my daily devotional, and I was reading about Balak and Balaam. If you know the story, it's one of the most bizarre stories in the Bible. Very, very. Uh, I mean, you got a donkey that speaks in the story, you know. So I'm telling you, it's a weird, trippy story, but. The, the point of it is that God is interweaving and he's behind the scenes of the blessing. And uh, it, because there's a man named Balak that wants to curse these people. So let's go ahead and talk about this for a moment. I'm going to preach about the blessings of God. Because I, I really do believe God wants to bless people. But there is the reality of the curse that we have to speak about as well. So if you would read with me Numbers 22, we're going to start in verse 1. And we're going to believe God together. It's going to help us. Then the Israelites traveled to the plains of Moab and camped along the Jordan across, the Jer Jer uh, across from Jericho. Now Balak, son of Zippor, saw that Israel had done to the Amorites, and Moab was terrified because there were so many people. Indeed, Moab was filled with dread because of the Israelites. Let's go ahead and jump to verse 5 here. So they sent messengers to summon Balaam, son of Bor, 
who was uh, at Pether near the Euphrates River in the native land of Balak, said, A people has come out of Egypt. They cover the face of the land and have settled next to me. Now come and put a curse on these people because they are too powerful for me. Perhaps then I will be able to feed them and drive them from out of the land. For I know that whoever you bless is blessed, and whoever you curse is cursed. Amen. The blessing of God. Let's go ahead and pray. God, I thank you for your grace. I thank you for your mercy. And I pray the Holy Spirit would be at work, God. I pray, Lord God, that the blessing of your name would come down, God. We rebuke the curses, uh, God, from our, from our past. We're asking your hand to be upon us. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's talk about the blessing and the cursing, because the Bible has a lot to say about this subject. There's a curse of in, uh, infertility. There's a curse of illness. There's a curse of famine. There's a curse of military losses, captivity, all found in Deuteronomy chapter 28. You can do your history on it. But spiritually, there are curses that we have to discuss. There is the curse of sin in the grave. Galatians 3.13, it says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us, for it is written, Curses everyone who hung is on a pole. Because spiritually there is a curse. What this means is that you and I were born sinners. I know that's crazy to say because we look at a baby and we say, Oh, how beautiful, right? Uh, how wonderful is this baby? No matter how they look, we think about, Wow, what an amazing, which obviously it is. But guess what? As soon as a baby poops and, and starts crying at night, you know that this is a sinner you're dealing with. But you understand that Christ, the Bible says, became a curse in order to remove the curse. This is the basis of Christianity. This is what we put our hope on. Is that from birth we are born under this curse from Adam. But you know what? The second Adam came and broke the curse. Am I right? Right? So you think about this. There is the curse, the physical curse that the Bible has, which is the curse of slavery. Galatians 4, 7, it says, So you no longer are slave, but God's child. Since you are his child, God made you also his heir. Paul is speaking about two actual slaves that were in the church. Yes, there were slaves in the church. But the slavery that Paul's talking about is not the slavery that we think about the Civil War in North America. It wasn't that kind of slavery that was based on race. It was based on what people could not pay. So if there was a debt that could not be paid. What they would do is they would become a slave to their master and have to work to pay off their debt. This is the slavery that Paul had spoke about. But these people were actual slaves. They would be called that. Living under bondage. They didn't know what freedom was. So people can be slaves, the Bible says, to sin. They could be slaves to drugs. How many know we know people who are bound in drugs? We know people who are slaves to alcohol. Living in, uh, in Montana here, I never thought I would know that AA would be so prevalent. I didn't know that alcoholism would be so widely um, you know, spoken about and people having under this curse, I believe. So people can be slaves also to debt. This is a physical representation of the curse. You, you could be uh, just having uh, to pay this debt. You cannot get over it. It, it. it just bothers you. How many know that? That's a terrible thing to, to know that you have to pay this, right? The Bible says you are a, a slave to the lender because of this curse. And then there's also the last one I'm going to speak about is a generational curse. Paul talks about when Genesis 9 verse 24 it says, when Noah awoke from the wine and found what he, his youngest son had done to him, he said, Cursed be Canaan, the lowest of slaves will he be to his brothers. And he also says, Praise the Lord, the God of Shem, that Canaan, Canaan be the slave of Shem. Ham is the son of his father, uh, Abraham. You know the story, what happened was, is Noah got a little too drunk at night. I don't know what was wrong with this guy, but whatever, we can go in depth with that later, but... The reality is this guy was naked and here comes Ham wanting to expose. And I'm going to tell you, read commentaries on this story and it is not a pretty story. Don't teach this one star. And, uh, and then, uh, you know, we can talk about Noah with all the elephants and the, the lions, you know, but don't go, I'm telling you, don't go this far because we can learn this later. 
But the reality here is that Ham did something wicked. And he saw his brother or his father and he wanted to shame him. And then uh, he, he comes in, he tells his brothers, look what dad is doing. And, and then they don't even want to look. They put the curry and they look back and they lay it over his father. But when he awoke, the Bible says he cursed Canaan. And understand something, Canaan is actually his grandson. It's Ham's son. So he was cursing the descendants of Ham. I'm going to tell you, Ham, this, the Canaan became a wild people. They, these people would be filled with idolatry. They would do child sacrifices, orgies, abominable things that they would do. Horrible, horrible things. But you think about that for a moment is that he cursed, not Ham, but he cursed his son. Generational curses. You think about your own life. You might have parents, grandparents. You share the same DNA with them, but you share also certain things with them, certain traits. You, you might carry lust, uh, or, or maybe there's divorce in your family. Maybe there's a spirit of fear in your family. There's a spirit of unfaithfulness. I mean, uh, I can go on and on about characteristics, about what people have to go on. These are generational curses that people live in. They have no idea. They just think that they're this way, they were born this way, and that's just how they live. But the reality is, the Bible says there are generational curses. So, if we covered the curses, now we have to talk about the blessing. Come on, somebody. Oh, yeah, give me that, man. That's what I want to hear, you know. Uh, shoot me with that in my vein, because I love the blessings. But you know what the interesting thing about the word blessing, the Bible says, it's an act of binding, a verbal pronouncement of something good. So when, when God says, oh, I'm going to bless you, he's making a, a proclamation that this is going to be good. When, when, when God made the heavens and the earth, when he made all the animals, he said this is good, meaning this is something that I'm blessing. I'm giving such a power that he's like, I'm blessing this. So the Bible says it's like a speaking a well of that. Further on, so the, they, there's a couple examples in the Bible about a spiritual blessing from a father to a son. Genesis 27, verse 27. When Isaac caught the smell of his clothes, he blessed him and said, Oh, the smell of my son is like the smell of the field that the Lord has blessed. May God give you heaven's dew and earth's richness and abundance of grain and new wine. May nations serve you and people bow down to you. Be Lord of your brothers, and may the sons of your mother bow down to you. May those who curse you be cursed, and those who bless you be blessed. This is a father blessing a son, telling him, this is going to be your life, and it's going to happen. It's going to come in packs. And then the Bible talks about even us as the ones who were not a Jew. We were blessed in adoption. It says in Ephesians 1.3, Praise be to the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in heavenly realms in every spiritual blessing in Christ. This is being born again. When you are born again, a born again believer, meaning you, you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior into your heart, you repented of your sins, the Bible says you have been adopted into His heavenly realms and he says that every spiritual blessing comes upon you. Come on, somebody. That's all we need. Then the Bible says there's also the blessing of finances. So, yes, now I got your attention. Am I right? Right? You got the, the gold bars, the, the, the million-dollar bill, right? You know what I mean? Come on. That's what we all want. When, when you think about blessings, many churches or, or whatever, they go down this route of the spiritual Bless, or the, the financial blessings because we all want that am I right we all pray for that we, we want to be blessed but the reality here is money doesn't always mean that you're blessed Hebrews 13 5 says keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have because God has said never will I leave you never will I forsake you so yes there is the, the financial blessing that God puts upon his children but it also comes with a, a servant mindset. and We can go on with that, but the reality is, I'm trying to let you know, is blessing doesn't always mean the wealth. Well, now let's talk about in our text. It's the curse of Balak. 
and Balak is the bad guy. Everybody wants to know who's the bad guy, right? I mean, every kid, we were kids, they watch these things and say, who's the bad guy? You know what I mean? Everybody wants to know who, who's the evil, you know, sorcerer in the, the story where Balak is not the, he's not the good guy, I'll tell you right now. So you understand something. We looked at the idea of cursing. We looked at the idea of blessing. And the point of our text is, is that God, His nature, I want to let you know before we get to it, is that God's nature is blessings. That's His nature. Because in our text, He's like, why, why would God allow this man to speak curses? That's the whole idea. Why, why would God allow this Balak and Balaam to stand on top of a mountain, to look down, to do sacrifices, to do this crazy thing on top, to look down and be like, you know, Balaam, I want to curse these people. But you think God allowed this, right? God allowed this moment in time. But I'm going to tell you, God's nature is a blessing. That's His nature. His nature is to love you. His nature is to take care of you. That's who He is. In Genesis 12, 2, it says, I will make you a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. This is Abraham receiving a blessing from God. Deuteronomy 15, 4. However, there is no need to be poor people among you. For in the land your Lord, your God is giving you, possessing as your, inher as your inheritance, he will richly bless you. This is God. I'll tell you, this is God. You've got to know that God wants to bless. God doesn't want to put curses. You have to take that thought and throw it away. God doesn't curse people. God doesn't want you to be living a cursed life. So when it comes to you personally, you no longer need to be bound in sin. People need to know that. They don't no longer need to be bound to the grave because what God's done on the cross. See, a Christian, once they understand salvation, once they understand that they are a child of God, that God saved them, that God redeemed them, the Bible says at that moment you are blessed, not cursed. Because of what I said. It said he broke the bonds of the curse by hanging and becoming a curse. When the Bible says that as a father would give you a fish instead of a stone, it's because of his nature. Let me tell you, isn't God good to us? Because there's times we can be like, God, where are you at? Why aren't you helping me? Where are you? You know, we can go on and on, man. We can write books about the things that God has not done yet. But the reality is, if we would just look in our heart and be like, God, you are good. I am thankful for you. You do love me. Because he says, God richly blesses those above all measures. So, one thing we have to understand something, though, is about Balak. Because there is an adversary, like I said. There is a bad guy who wants to put a curse on God's people. We see that in our text. He says, now come and put a curse on these people because they are too powerful for me. Perhaps then I will be able to defeat them and drive them out from the land. For I know whatever you bless is blessed. Whoever is cursed is cursed. So Balak in our text, he, he goes down and he hires a man named Balaam. It's very hard to remember these names. You know, Balak and Balaam, we get them intertwined sometimes, but... Balak goes, he's the king of Moab, and he goes and he finds a man named Balaam. And Balaam is not a Jew, he's just a guy that's a prophet. And he hires this guy and he says, listen, I need you to do something for me. These people down there, they are mighty, they are dangerous, and I don't like them. They're going to take over the land and they're going to defeat me because of what I've seen them do. Now I'm hiring you to curse them. But instead, God... Remember, his nature is to bless. God's nature is not to curse. So you think about this blessing, it is true because God loves us. Why do Christians, though, still feel like they're under a curse? Because that's the reality of this text. Because there is a Balak out there who wants to put a curse on God's people. He doesn't like them, he hates them, he wants to defeat them, he's fearful of them. And he wants to curse them, meaning everything I said. He wants to have military overpowering them. He wants them to be infertile. He wants them to be just enslaved people. That's what the curse is. But God's nature is not for us to live that way. 
But the reality is, is Christians still feel as they're under a curse. And this is where people feel like they're robbed of the blessing. Galatians 5.1, it says, It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm, then do not let yourselves be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. If you capture all that, it is absolutely amazing. Because, she says, it is for freedom Christ set us free. Don't be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. So there's a practical reasoning that we have to understand here. Is that, you know what, we have to give no place to the devil, the Bible says. You don't give him a foothold. Because if you give him a little bit of a foothold, a little bit of the beach of your life, then the Bible says he's able to infiltrate the rest of your life. So understand, that is a true statement. You cannot allow the curse to come into your life. This is practical things, right? You can't allow and invite the old self to come back. You can't invite old things, old habits, old friends, old songs, old desires, old everything. Come on. can't have the old come back. You cannot do it. That's practical, right? But it's so interesting is that people can easily go back to the same yoke of sin that God pulled us out of. And I'm going to tell you, it's, it's like we do it to ourselves. We literally do it. We literally have been set free. The yoke is thrown away. But then it's so interesting how we literally turn back and snap that thing right back on our neck and go right back to the old life. But the interesting is that the Bible says here, 1 Corinthians 6, 18, practical, flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside the body. Whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. He says, flee from it, right? This is practical. We can control our bodies. No one forces us to do anything that we don't want to. Practically, you can do it. The Bible says, flee. That means literally to run away, right? Like, don't even think about it. Like, I don't know if you ever ran from somebody before. I mean, we don't need to go into past things, but I ran before. I'm going to tell you why I fled. I fled, man. I fled. I fled, man. I was, I was faster than lightning, man. Because I knew I had to get away. That's what the Bible used, that same exact word. you got to flee like that. Paul is reminding the church and us that Jesus paved the way for freedom. He did this on the cross. When Jesus said, it is finished. How many know when he said it's finished? That means it's finished. But spiritually, he's warning the church and us, don't be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. That is the practical sense to it. You can allow a curse to come back into your life. That's practical. But now there's a spiritual reasoning, right? Because we need to understand this. Because many times, like I said before, we don't see this other side of the coin. We can understand, yes, flee from things. That means, you know, if, if sexual immorality is, is bothering you, lustful thoughts or even anger, people can get upset and they can allow these things to come into your life. Yes, you can, you can stop listening to music. You can uh, stop hanging out with friends. You could, you could go and uh, take a sledgehammer to your computer if you need to. You know what I mean? These are practical things you can do. But we talk about the spiritual side. Of, it's like, whoa, what does that mean? How do I spiritually get over things? Well, the, the reality is it can be done. Because in verse 2, we understand of our text is that the, the Bible says that Balak, Balak was terrified because there were so many people. So he, he's standing outside of this Israelites watching. He's watching these people looking down. And the Bible says he sees them. But God's like, no, I already blessed these people, you know. But there's a spiritual warfare that is taking place. And it almost eludes us because we can't see it. We can't feel it. We can't touch it. If we only had spiritual glasses that we could put on and remind us and say, oh, there, there's a battle right there, you know what I mean? There's a demon over there, you know? I wish we could have that, you know? But we don't. We don't. But things are obvious sometimes. We need to understand that there really is an enemy. There really is a biblical enemy against our soul that is waging war. 
Because something that we see in the, our, our scripture here is that there's an outside force that is trying to penetrate the ranks of Israel. Wanting to curse them. Because the Bible says that Balak was afraid. I'm telling you, the enemy of your soul doesn't want you to live in freedom. He wants you to head right back into slavery and live under the curse that God has set you free from. And you know what? We think blessing is gold, but I'm going to tell you, blessing is not always gold. It's not always silver. It's not always a shekel. It's not, it's not any of those. You know, we always think that, but spiritual blessing is just like just living in freedom. That, that, that's what it is. So the enemy is like, man, he's afraid of that. It's afraid for me to live in power. To live in freedom where I, I'm not weak any longer, right? That that scares the enemy, but he wants to put a curse on people. So we're looking right at what I'm gonna tell you right now. We have to understand something. We have to wake up. You have to spiritually wake up, because if this text is true, which I believe it is, then that really does mean there's a Balak, right? There's an enemy that's looking upon and wanting to curse. Wanted to throw everything back in our lives so that we could return back to slavery. So let's look at living a life blessed. Because in our text, like I said, Balak is on top of the hill wanting to conquer these people. And these people have been saved. They've been, they've been you know, spiritually and living in freedom for however many years. And here comes Balak living on top of this hill looking down. And he's looking and says, I, I want to get rid of these people. Well, first and foremost, we need to see ourselves as God sees us. Numbers 24, verse 5 says, How beautiful are your tents, Jacob. Your dwelling places, Israel. Like valleys, they spread out like gardens beside the river, like aloes planted by the Lord, like cedar beside the waters. This is how God is seeing the children. Remember Balak. Balak is looking on them, and he's saying, "Look at these, look at these people. I dread them. I, I fear them." And he—that's that, what he's saying here. Balak is looking on top of this hill, and, and, and is only wanting death upon these people. But how many know we have a God that looks upon us and loves us? Because He looks on them. God's looking at the same people, and He's looking at them and saying, "How beautiful are these people?" How beautiful are these tents. Look at them. They're like aloe planted by the Lord. Used for healing. I'm going to tell you. God sees you as, as blessed. God doesn't look at you like. Look at them cursed people down there. God looks at you and says. Look how beautiful these tents are. Look at this garden that I have planted. Look at these aloe. Deuteronomy 23 verse 4. As for they did not come to meet you with bread and water on their own way when you went and came out of Egypt. They hired Balaam, son of Bor, from Pather to Aram, to pronounce a curse on you. However, the Lord your God would not listen to Balaam. He turned the curse into a blessing for you, because the Lord your God loves you. I'm going to tell you, you have to dwell in that state right there. I'm going to tell you, you've got to see God. You gotta, you gotta know that God sees you as blessed. God sees you as He loves you. I'm gonna tell you, God doesn't want lies and hell to penetrate your life. That's the whole idea about this text: is that there's this enemy who wants to spew cursing. But you know what He says here? That whatever I bless, I have blessed. I can't take that back. The Bible says that He is not a man that He should lie. So the second thing is, you have to identify there really are threats. We can't live in la-la land, right? We can't believe that there's no Balak. We say, oh, like, that's Old Testament stuff, or that's not real. But we have to know that there truly is an enemy that wants to curse our lives. Well, the, the, the point I'm trying to make is how do we fight back then? I'm going to tell you, you assault hell on your knees in prayer. And there's three things that you need to understand that keep the blessings of God. One, you have to keep dominion. And what that means is that once you take dominion, once you say no to hell and say no to sin, I'm going to tell you, you've got to keep up with that. You can't just say no today and then tomorrow allow it to slip and 
and say, you know what, that's okay. I'll let it slide today, but I, I'll take care of it tomorrow. No, dominion, what the Bible says, it's an act of aggression. It's not this lazy mindset of Christianity. In Matthew 26, 40, it says, Then he returned to disciples and found them sleeping. Could you men keep watch with me for one hour? I'm going to tell you, don't expect to win spiritually if you don't know how to pray. Don't expect it. Don't expect to, to ride this wave uh, of Christianity without learning to pray. I'm going to tell you, you're gonna, that's a weak Christianity and you won't make it very far. The conclusion of salvation and conclusion is taking dominion and keep what God has given us. The second thing is, is that you don't allow the enemy to hold you by the throat. Luke 10, 19, it says, I've given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. This is God telling us, you, 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 you don't let the enemy come to your house, you know. You don't let it just sleep in your bedroom. You do something about it. I'll tell you this story about these, these stinking snakes that ate my pet birds when I was a kid. Man, when I was a kid, that destroyed me. That destroyed me. I'm a little, like, eight-year-old dude, and that destroyed me, man. I remember crying. I said, man, my birds, my poor birds, you know. And I, and I saw this stinking snake come in, slither, and eat all my birds. And I said, I'll never allow this to happen again. You understand me? I'll never allow this to happen again. I took that snake, and I cut that snake's head off. I, I don't know what you do with snakes, but I'm going to tell you, a good snake is a dead snake in my book. Yeah. But the reality is, what do you do with the enemy? Do you allow it to live in your life? Do you allow the slithering snake to walk around and slither around? I'm telling you, snakes are evil creatures. They ain't nothing pretty about a snake. I don't know how people have them as pets. I think they're, I'm like, what are you doing, man? You got to feed these things rats. You got to feed them anything. You know, that snakes are not men. I, I, I mean, I, I, all I got to say is you got to take the enemy by the throat. And then the last thing I talk about is that you take threats and you send them back to hell. Because I'm going to tell you, curses are thrown at people. I'm going to tell you, there really is an enemy. I'm you, if we would just wake up to that. If we would just wake up to there really is a spiritual warfare. There really is an enemy. I'm going to tell you, there really is. I'm going to tell you the, the, an old saying that our, our fellowship has used and that I have used is that a devil exposed is a devil defeated. God is not human that he should not uh, lie. This is Numbers 23 and 19. He should not change his mind. Does he speak and then not act? Does he promise and does not fulfill? I have received the command to bless. He has blessed and I cannot change. This is God. So you have to take that and hold that and put it in your heart and say, you know what, God does not lie. God has blessed me. God has helped me. That means I can live through this. But there's a reality that the enemy is true. And a devil exposed is a devil defeated. And I'm going to just go right now and say, when you feel depressed, when you feel sad, when, and I mean not just a regular sad, listen, we can get sad sometimes. How many know that? And it's not unnatural to be sad. It's not unnatural to have emotion. You know what I mean? But when it's like an overshadowed emotion. It's like this overcast that comes upon you. And you're like, man, where is this from? Today's such a good day. Why do I feel like this? I'm going to tell you, that's from hell. If you feel like it, you can't get over something. And you try and try and try. I'm going to tell you, that's from hell. And you have to expose, that's why it says the devil exposed and the devil defeated. So when you expose the actual spiritual curse behind it, then you can defeat it. Because if not, you're going to throw a bunch of uh, worldly things. You're like, oh, well, I feel depressed. Let me go put on a happy song, you know. Uh, oh, I feel sad for a moment. Let me go and do this. You, 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 have, you can't throw worldly answers at these things. You, you have to take it. It's like, no, this is, this is hell. I'm going to tell you, you have to... You have to defeat the enemy. I'm telling you, there was a moment not very long ago, and there was a, uh, I, I'm telling you, I felt this overcast on my soul, on my heart. And I said, what is going on? Things are good. You know, things are all right. I, I had nothing to complain about. I mean, things are all right. You know what I mean? Money's there. Family's good. Everybody's healthy. 
but an overcast of just like, man, I can't go. I felt like this rain cloud following me everywhere I went. And I just felt this way and said, well, let me just chalk it up to just, you know, that's just how it is. It's just a season, you know. But then I, I, it was exposed that there was a witch. And I'm like, man, there's a curse that, that was put. And I said, man, it's, it's not right. And I sent it back. And you know what? I'm telling you, you got to do the same thing. You have to do the same thing. And now every time I you get this moment of like, you know, it's like, what is going on? You've got to send it back. So, all I can say is, he says here, Numbers 23, 19, I'll say it again. God is not human that he should lie. Not a human being that he should change his mind. Does he speak and then not act? Does he promise and not fulfill? I have received the command to bless. He has blessed. And he cannot change it. That's who God is. God has blessed you. God has blessed you. No longer under a curse. God can help you. I'm going to pray for people at the end of the service. Let's go ahead and bow our heads real quickly to God. Amen. Close our eyes respecting our name. I want to thank you all for coming. Hallelujah. God is good and He is righteous. See, that is the words of a Savior. God took us out of a miry clay, the Bible says. The Bible says here is that He took us and created us sons and daughters. He loves us so much. Praise be to God, our Father, who has blessed us in heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. That's God. He says here that He will never leave us, that He will never forsake us. The Bible says, Praise be the Lord our God. Praise His name. That we are no longer slaves, but God's child. Amen. The Bible says, Galatians 3.13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse. That's who God is. I'm going to tell you, that's God's nature. God's nature is blessing. God's nature is to redeem. God's nature is to restore. That is who God is. So sometimes we can move away from the blessing. We could, we could turn our backs. The Bible says we could literally put the yoke back on of slavery. We can do that in many different ways. But you know what? God is right here and He can help us. So real quickly before I pray for people, if you're not right with God, I'm going to tell you, God can help you. God can remove the sin upon our lives, which is the greatest miracle that has ever been done. I'm going to tell you, salvation. What He's done on the cross, and not only that, how He rose from the grave three days, the greatest miracle. He did that to defeat sin. And He's done that for us. So real quickly, you're not right with God. I'm going to pray with you real fast. I want you to raise your hand in this place. I'm going to pray with you real quick. And then we'll move on. Hallelujah. God is good. Worthy. Amen. Redeemed us. Redeemed us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm going to do one thing real quickly. I'm going to open up the altars. Maybe God might be speaking to you. If you're battling things in your life, I'm going to tell you, don't allow the enemy to lie to you. Don't allow the enemy to tell you that you are defeated. Don't allow the enemy to remind you of every past failure. These are the ideas of the curse. Don't let the curse be the thing that overshadows your life. I'm telling you, God is a God of blessing. He is not human that He should lie. For when He blesses, He blesses, and He cannot take that back. Hallelujah. Let's believe God together. Let's pray. God, I thank You for Your grace. God, I thank You for the blood. I thank You, God, for all that You are doing in our lives, God. I pray, God, uh, uh, Your hand to be upon You. God, we rebuke the curse right now, Lord God. We speak life and faith that you would build it back up unto your people. And I thank you, Lord God, all for all that you are going to do and all that you have done. She Yanda shi yanda ribe be yandu rababa yanda 
You are mighty God. You are awesome in power. You are righteous and holy. She anda ribe be andu ribe. Yanda ribe be yanda. Oh, thank you, God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Let's give God praise in this place. She anda raba ba yandu ribe be yanda ribe. Yanda ribe be yandu ribe. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Real quickly, I'm going to pray with anybody who feels like they're just under a curse. And what that means is like, man, you feel assaulted. You feel like you, you just can't overcome things. I'm going to tell you, God can help you. God can move in your life. So if you feel like you're under assault, and I mean, this is ab, it's like an abnormal assault. It's not like an ordinary thing. It's like, man, it just comes back. And I'm telling you, that's from hell. It's not from God. So uh, it's reality here is as true is that there really is an enemy that wants to put curses upon us. So what we're going to do is we're going to rebuke the lies from hell. We're going to rebuke just man, just anything that someone's not even spoken about us. I'm telling you, everything. We're gonna, you can't believe God. And I really do believe God's going to set us free. So let's go ahead and lift our hands. I'm going to pray for you, okay? So just repeat after me, okay? Say, Jesus. Today, I believe that you died on the cross, and that you became a curse to remove the curse. I come against words that have been spoken against me. I rebuke the lies from hell, from anything that is against me. I send it back to hell, and I believe your word. Of your blessing. Bless my mind. Bless my heart. For who the sun sets free. Is set free indeed. In Jesus name. Amen. Let's give God praise. I'm going to pray for you. Hallelujah God. I pray your hand to be upon him Lord God. God, I pray, Lord God, you set the captive free, Lord God, that you would move by the power and by the blood. We rebuke all curses, uh, all, Lord God, any lies from hell. Hallelujah. Let's give God praise. God, you are mighty and awesome and powerful. Hallelujah. You are righteous and mighty. Amen and amen. Live in freedom and God will help us. Let's go and pray. This has God to help us. I'm telling you, we rebuke anything that comes. Generational curses, send it back to hell. Hallelujah. Live a life of freedom. Let's go and pray. God, I thank you for the blood. God, I thank you for what you have done on the cross. God, help us every single day. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you right here.